Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at washingtech.com forward slash book. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Moving the needle. Welcome to the Washington Tech Policy Podcast. Curating communications, media, and tech policy news so you don't have to. News, interviews, everything you need without the axe to grind. It's the Washing Tech Policy Podcast Policy with Podcast. Joe Miller. WikiLeaks wreaks havoc on the DNC. Ed Snowden designs a surveillance evading iPhone case. And Jennifer Posner is my guest. WikiLeaks released a trove of 20,000 DNC emails leading to the resignation of Debbie Wasserman Schultz as Democratic National Convention Chair. The emails appear to show the DNC manipulating the primary process in favor of Hillary Clinton, and the leak led Sanders supporters to revolt in protest on the floor of the convention arena in Philadelphia. You can find this story covered pretty much every place. NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden and renowned researcher and hacker Andrew Bunny Hang unveiled a new device at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology last week. It's an iPhone case that'll help its owners evade surveillance detection. They say the device is intended for people like reporters and correspondents reporting in hostile territories. Andy Greenberg at Wired has the full story. Google reports that searches for, quote, third-party candidates spiked by 1,150% during the Republican National Convention last week. Freedom of Information Act FOIA researcher Ryan Shapiro is suing the Department of Justice for using antiquated equipment to search for documents related to FOIA requests, even though the DOJ has access to far better technology worth $425 million. The FOIA law states that federal agencies must make reasonable efforts to meet FOIA requests, but Shapiro's complaint alleges that the DOJ routinely uses the outdated equipment to conduct searches and turn requesters away, amounting to the the difference between a library card catalog and keyword search. Sam Thielman at The Guardian has more. While he was promoting his forthcoming movie about Edward Snowden, Oliver Stone, the Oscar-winning director of Platoon and JFK, remarked at Comic-Con International last week that Pokemon Go is an invasion of privacy and an example of, quote, surveillance capitalism, end quote. Many privacy advocates have noted that Pokemon Go's terms of service requires users to consent to their data being shared with law enforcement. The Guardian has more. The Clinton campaign brought geofilters to reach young voters during the Republican National Convention last week. Geofilters are overlays Snapchat users can place over their snaps, which show their location, the time, the temperature, or events and logos. One of the Clinton campaign's geofilters features yellow police tape with the words Stop Trump written on it. Another included anti-Trump quotes issued by prominent Republicans. Don Schmalewski covers this in Recode. The Wall Street Journal reported last week that a senior DOJ official presented a White House plan that calls for allowing foreign countries to issue search warrants on U.S. tech companies, but the warrants would only be allowed for non-U.S. citizens. The plan is designed to enable the U.S. to have the ability to search data in other countries. The plan would start in the U.K., but the U.S. Congress would need to approve, as well as legislators in the U.K. Devlin Barrett at the Wall Street Journal has full coverage. Finally, Verizon has acquired Yahoo in a $4.8 billion acquisition. The move is seen as a strategy shift away from pure telecom and more towards big data and advertising. The deal comes as the FCC is considering how to use its authority to issue new privacy rules pertaining to telecom companies. Stay with us. Oh. 
For Washington Tech Policy Podcast listeners, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. You can listen at the gym, in the car, or on your morning run. How about future crimes? Everything is connected, everyone is vulnerable, and what can we do about it by Mark Goodman. You can download Future Crimes free by trying audible.com. Sign up for your free audiobook and 30-day trial today at washingtech.com forward slash book. My guest today is Jennifer Posner, founder and executive director of Women in Media and News, WIMN, a media analysis, education, and advocacy group. She's also the author of Reality Bites Back, The Troubling Truth About Guilt, Pleasure, TV. A widely published journalist, Jennifer serves on the board of editors of In These Times magazine. Her work has appeared in corporate media outlets such as Newsday, Chicago Tribune, and the Boston Phoenix. Independent magazine. Magazines such as Miss Magazine, The American Prospect, and Bitch Feminist, Response to Pop Culture, and online media such as Women E News, Alternet, and Salon, among others. Jennifer has appeared as a media commentator on NBC, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, ABC News Now, Grit TV, Democracy Now, NPR, and Comedy Central's The Daily Show. She's gone head-to-head with Bill O'Reilly, Sean Hannity, and Joe Scarborough. Forbes has named Jennifer one of 20 inspiring women to follow on Twitter, and BizTech Day's list of 25 influential businesswomen in New York City you should follow on Twitter has included Jennifer along Side Tyra Banks, Martha Stewart, and Vera Wang. Please welcome Jennifer Posner. Today we're going to be looking at content and the media environment media ownership policies have created, especially around how minorities and women are depicted on reality TV shows. Jennifer Posner is here to shed some light on these issues for us. So Jennifer, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Joe. So Jennifer, first of all, should people stop watching reality TV? Well, look, as a media literacy educator, as a media critic, it's never really my job to tell people what media they should or shouldn't engage with. Um, I'm not I'm not a fairy godmother. I don't have a, a magic wand. I can't and I don't even want to change people's behavior. All I want to do and my entire goal as a media critic, as a media literacy educator is to get people to engage with their critical filters turned on and whether that's with when they're watching a reality show or whether they're reading the New York Times, whether they're engaging with NPR, PBS, um, music videos, it's incredibly important to be active, critical media consumers. And that means to arm yourself against ideological and consumer um, commercial propaganda, basically. Um, If people really enjoy reality TV, uh, it's not my... Uh, my role in the world to try and kill their fun, right? It's it's not, media literacy isn't about being a buzzkill. It's just about giving people tools and frameworks um, through which they can understand that th- things are, are in media are more than just entertainment. You're always being informed whether you know it or not. So the goal is to get you to know it. Now, archetypes are these stock characters that have been in storytelling since the beginning. You have the hero, the rebel, the lover, the jester, the innocent, and many other archetypes. We see these patterns repeatedly in our literature and movies and television. Even podcasters take on archetypes. So are reality producers throwing caution to the wind when they produce reality TV shows, or do they actively assign cast members their own archetype and require them to stick to that? Oh, there's no throwing caution to the wind in reality TV, everything is meticulously produced and the production and the scripting, the de facto scripting starts with casting. Um, The archetypes, the tropes that appear in reality TV are incredibly specific and calculated. So for example, women are regularly cast and edited. So first of all, when I say the, the sort of scripting starts with casting, I mean that casting agents and producers work together to find people who they think they will be able to either actively coach into becoming certain, behaving in certain ways that are easy to edit into a particular trope or particular stereotype, or they cast people they think they can easily manipulate into those behaviors. So for example, women are cast and edited into some very specific tropes in reality TV. There's 
the uh, the idea that women are stupid. Um, there's the idea that women are gold diggers. There's the idea that women are uh, bitchy and catty and not to be trusted, especially not by other women. Um, those tropes get replayed on loop. There's also the idea that single women are pathetic, desperate, man-hungry uh, whores who can never possibly be happy or successful or fulfilled without um, being chosen by some guy, any guy. Doesn't matter if he's a respectful or intelligent or compassionate or loving guy. Just he just basically needs to be able to fill out, um, you know, a, a firm butt in a nice uh, pair of jeans, and the wallet should match. And if his wallet is is big, his butt doesn't even matter that much. That's all men are apparently valued for in reality TV. That's their trope. Um, and then you know when you look at uh, distinctions beyond just gender, um, women of color in reality TV are cast to become um, the embodiments of very specific subtropes that uh, where women of color have to deal with all of the tropes that I just mentioned, stupidity, gold digger, pathetic, loser who can never be happy without a man, um, petty, catty, all of that. But when, when race is added on top of the gendered tropes, then you see black women are regularly portrayed as angry. Um, there's the angry black woman trope. There's the uh, ignorant quote unquote ghetto uh, trope where the character is always supposed to be uh, just one moment away from becoming violence, either verbally or physically violence. Um, and where uh, and there's the hypersexuality trope um, with uh, with other women of color, with Latinas, for example, hypersexuality features uh, quite prominently in stereotypes about Latina women in reality TV uh, as women, for example, very specifically words like hoochie and hot tamale and uh, et cetera are used with Latinas. Um, Asian women are very rarely cast at all in reality TV, but when they do appear, it tends to be with one of two tropes, either the uh, sort of shy fading flower geisha trope um, or the uh, sort of severe hypersexual dragon lady, scary, you know, dominatrix type trope. Um, so there's no there's no sort of, oh, let's see what we throw at the wall and see what sticks with reality TV. Everything is very crafted um, for very specific purposes. And those tropes aim to reinforce deeply regressive ideas about who women are, about who people of color are, and about what Americans are supposed to believe and value at a time in the world when mostly we've moved beyond those ideas. Mm -hmm. And you've written and spoken extensively about the role of reality TV as a kind of backlash against advances in civil rights and women's rights. Can you tell us about how you think about this issue? You know, it is. And it's uh, a lot of people, I wrote that very um, very clearly, one of the reasons that I wrote the book Reality Bites Back, The Troubling Truth About Guilty Pleasure TV, uh, was because at the time that I was researching and writing the book, uh, nobody was really taking seriously what this genre, this incredibly influential genre of television, was trying to get us to believe about who we were as a country. If you were, um, if you were not somebody who ever knew anything about Americans or America, if you were from another country and had never come here personally, or if you're an alien and just sort of landed here, right? You would believe if all you ever had as source material about our country was reality shows, was The Bachelor, was Survivor, was Joe Millionaire, was Project Runway, was the real housewives of every other city in the book, you would believe that the women's rights movement never happened, mm -hmm. that the civil rights movement never happened. Um, you might believe that uh, sort of the sexual liberation movement happened, but only only in so much as um, queer people are allowed to dress nicely in fashion shows and um, hookups are wildly encouraged in hot tubs. But that's about as much for uh, changing social norms as you'd see in reality television. You ask about the genre rolling back the clock on civil rights. Um, that's basically in a nutshell 
uh, what you can take away from Flavor of Love and all the spinoffs of that show from the mid 2000s on, um, you, the idea that men of color are primarily either buffoons and jesters, um, minstrels, basically minstrel area, stere minstrel era stereotypes, or are quote unquote thugs and criminals. Mm -hmm. um, we have, we have other areas of our culture that reinforce those kinds of tropes, right? We have, uh, and, and those areas of culture have given life to Black Lives Matter movement and other civil rights movements because those areas of culture are so damaging that they actively uh, negatively impact the way people are able to get educated or not, who gets sent to prison and who doesn't, who gets killed and who gets to live. Um, but when it's in reality TV and it's just the water that we swim in and the entertainment that we're supposed to just laugh at, nobody takes it Seriously, that's one of the main reasons that I decided I needed to really uh, research and monitor and analyze this genre from the year 2000 until the year 2010 for the book, because I wanted people to understand that exactly what you just asked um, is true, that the the genre is making its, it, it, its reality TV producers and networks have basically planted a cultural flag in the ground to declare that um, that America has not progressed past the mindset of the 1950s, 1960s, um, except for uh, free sex. And that is really problematic when you look at what's eventually, you know, everybody's so surprised now in, in the sort of political chattering classes, everybody's so surprised that Donald Trump became the GOP nominee uh, using incredibly racist, incredibly misogynistic, incredibly xenophobic rhetoric on the campaign trail. No one should be surprised. I monitor all of that um, from Donald Trump on The Apprentice every week in people's living rooms on NBC for almost a decade. Mm -hmm. And Jen, what are the effects of these depictions on viewers, particularly on young girls and women? Um, I'm really glad you asked about young girls. You know, before I wrote the book, there wasn't really much in the way of any kind of data about how viewers receive reality TV. There used to be, in the 80s, viewer reception research about how television impacted the uh, the mindsets and the political viewpoints of viewers. For example, there was, a um, in the book I referenced uh, repeatedly, a study that had been done by the University of Massachusetts turned into a, uh, a book by Sutjali um, from, the, from UMass called Enlightened Racism. And it was a study about how viewers related to the Cosby show and how the Cosby show's intent was to create uh, sort of a more enlightened audience that uh, where racism uh, declined. But because class was uh, was so skewed in that sitcom and the, the family had a doctor for a father and a lawyer for a mother. And it was in the, in the eighties in the height of the Reagan era, but there was really no discussion ever of poverty or, or that kind of injustice. Um, it turned out that focus group after focus group of viewers uh, related so strongly to Cliff Huxtable and Claire Huxtable. They really started talking about those characters as if they were real people in their real lives, their real friends, their real neighbors, their real uh, classmates and teachers at school, et cetera. Um, so to the point where they, viewers of the Cosby show in the eighties were less likely to support affirmative action than people who didn't watch because they would think, oh, if Cliff and Claire could have such great jobs and be so wealthy, why can't my black neighbors get off their butts and get a, a, a good job? That's interesting. Uh, so there's no more viewer reception research in that kind of, that's not happening right now in this country. Nobody's doing that anymore. Even Sut Jolly at UMass at the Media Education Foundation says that they're, that that kind of research th that they were doing back then is not really in favor anymore because it's time, consu time consuming and expensive. Um, however, I refer to that research so much because um, it is safe to, I think that it is safe to assume that even though we don't have active data on uh, how viewers are receiving reality shows, um, if 
sitcoms where everybody knew that very famous actors um, and very famous uh, networks, right? This was NBC. That show was on NBC with some of the most famous actors in the country. If people understood that this was a sitcom, it was written by uh, by a team of writers, it was filmed, actors rehearsed their lines, and they put it on the air once a week. It was appointment TV. They understood this was entertainment television, and yet they still related to the characters so strongly that it affected their political viewpoints mm -hmm. to the point where they were less likely to support progressive uh, civil rights policies. Then I think that it is safe to assume that a genre of TV in which um, producers manipulate the audience so strongly where they are only showing you less than 1% of what they've filmed mm -hmm. because for every one hour of a reality show that you see as a viewer, usually they have shot more than a hundred hours of tape and the 1% that they are showing you is highly edited. But the, but that genre uses characters where those characters are called by their real names of who they are in their real life but who they are in their real life is not actually depicted on screen. It's They are turned into whatever trope, whatever stereotype the uh, producers need them to fill for that particular episode or that particular season. Um, the One of the biggest lies of this genre is, um, oh, we, we're just giving the public what they want. And what they want are these depictions of real people behaving as they really think and feel and doing what they would normally do if the cameras weren't there. Um, it is reasonable to assume that viewers on some level believe that this is in some way a realistic depiction of these people and their values. When for 15, 16 years now, day after day after day, hour after hour after hour over the span of several hundred shows, season after season, the same ideas get reinforced over and over in the name of contemporary realism, in the name of this is just who Americans are, that people of color are still uh, second class citizens, that women are still useless without men and can never be happy or successful without male approval, validation, and um, and acceptance that uh, that women are intellectually inferior to men and can't compete. For example, our GOP nominee, uh, his show for a decade has portrayed women as unable to compete intellectually and professionally in a business context unless they use their sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, over and over, all of these damaging, misogynistic and racist tropes that reality TV has fomented um, have all been fomented in the name of realism. I think that the impact is it's hard to measure with data because nobody's producing that data now. But I think it's it's a safe bet to say that the um, that we have some real world impact now, for example, our political process in the in this election cycle has been shifted to a um, to a really disturbing degree I believe in part by the acceptance of these kinds of ideas in the reality TV genre the yeah. only data by numbers that I can offer after I was done with the book the Girl Scouts of America came out with a a poll, a phone poll, I believe it was, um, of a little more than a thousand girls, if I remember correctly. And they asked uh, young girls several questions about their viewership of reality TV. Did they watch? Didn't they watch? What did they watch, et cetera? And asked them very specific things about how they feel in relation to that. And they found that girls who watch reality TV are more likely than other girls to believe that it is in girls' inherent nature to be catty and competitive with each other, mm. especially over boys. They Girls who watch reality TV were more likely to expect and accept a higher level of aggression and bullying in their lives. And there are other studies that have shown the, the effect of media on real life behavior. I mean, you have studies that have been done on particular shows. I saw one on SpongeBob that, you know, uh, test subjects who were given a test immediately after watching SpongeBob, this is a Northwestern study, actually performed less well on the exam after 
watching SpongeBob. So, but it is it is difficult to to show. But that Girl Scout study uh, seems pretty credible. Yeah, I mean, and and the thing is, I do want to make a distinction. It's a survey and not a study. I it see. was a okay. poll. Right? But it, but it's in, but I think it's an important one, um, and there also have been other studies that have shown um, that watching reality TV cosmetic surgery shows have made women feel less uh, less uh, satisfied with their bodies than before they watched the cosmetic surgery shows like Extreme Makeover and The Swan and et cetera, where where producers would put women under the knife for numerous procedures within a short period of weeks and never tell the audience uh, about the medical risks involved with such procedures. Um, so yeah, it, it's an incredibly damaging genre that we're only beginning to see the outlines of the negative impact. Jennifer, it's been a privilege having you on the show. So thanks once again for joining me. I just want to ask you a few more questions and then we'll close. Sound like a plan? Absolutely. All right. On this podcast, we like to talk about policy and entrepreneurship, but also about what makes successful people like you tick. Tell us, Jennifer, what are some habits, tactics, and apps that you use every day to stay on top of your game as an entrepreneur? I, I just, it, there's no big secret. I just like to read really broadly um, every day. And so, you know, sometimes I'm, of course, I'm following the headlines on in the New York Times and et cetera, but I'm also looking at you know, the Crunk Feminist Collective, and I'm looking at the establishment, which is one of my favorite new in the last year. Think about how great this is. Uh, two young women got a little bit, tiny little bit of venture capital, launched a diverse uh, news and culture website, women-owned news and culture website with a six-person team, and they called it the establishment. I love that because it's exactly the counter to what you were just saying about the bros, right? In in everybody thinks of establishment media, um, but you know, so I read a lot of independent media every day, um, and I also follow. A lot of um, I'm not as up on podcasts as some, but I tend to to spend a lot of time um, still on Twitter, on Facebook, um, following what other people are talking about and where the holes are. Um, when I started doing media criticism in the in the mid '90s, and specifically feminist media criticism in the mid '90s, there was really there was nothing. There was one organization in the country, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, that did that as a professional endeavor that was outside of academia. There was nothing else. And there was only one person in that organization that focused primarily on women. That was at the time, Laura Flanders. She ran, ran the women's desk at FAIR. And I always thought, well, there's clearly not going to be a way for me to do this as a living, as a professional thing, because nobody does this except Laura. And why would she ever leave the women's desk? She's perfect at it. And that's the only job in the country that does this. And then she left the women's desk and I ended up getting that job. And I ran the women's desk at Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting for several years. And then when I left FAIR, I founded Women in Media and News to continue that work, but on a broad level, focusing not only on news media, but on news media as well as entertainment media, and also to um, to make sure that it wasn't just media criticism, media monitoring that I was doing, um, but I wanted to help build a feminist media movement where we were doing media trainings for nonprofits. We were doing media literacy work for students and for uh, community groups. We were doing helping uh, activists get their voices heard in media and helping journalists find women um, who are qualified in every field to talk to as sources for their stories. Because the question you asked before about women behind the scenes also applies to the underrepresentation of women's voices as sources and shapers of news. Um, so I founded Women in Media and News to get that work done. And I've been really happy to see that over the years, um, I've, I've had a lot of company now. When I first started doing this work, there was nothing really in the field. Now, you know, there's a group called Women Action and, Me Media, Women Action and the Media that Jamia Wilson heads. There's, um, you know, there's the feminist blogosphere, uh, which didn't exist when I started doing this work. So it's, it's not like there's one particular outlet that I read every day that I say, you know, this is the one thing that you should do to stay on top of it. It's, um, it's pay attention to what, everybody is talking about. And then for me, find the holes where people aren't analyzing uh, the issues the way I think they need to be analyzed and then weigh in on that. 
And tell us the name of a book that you read recently that you're recommending to everyone who asks you for a book recommendation. I am really excited. I've just started reading Andy Zeisler's book, We Were Feminists Once, and I'm really excited about it because she she's a one of the co-founders of Bitch Magazine, and she has she's put into book length form an argument that I've been making for a long time, which is that advertisers and commercial forces have been co-opting and uh, sucking the lifeblood out of feminism to resell it back to us as this soulless um, the soulless concept that just helps us buy more things. Mm -hmm. And so she's sort of um, building out that argument in book length form about what does it mean for our culture right now that, um, that the feminist movement has been so commodified as to, in some ways, um, lose a lot of its power, while at the same time, there are obvious benefits when um, when feminism is seen as something so positive that an artist like Beyonce would put the word feminist beyond behind her when she does a massive, um, was, I think it was Super Bowl performance and, and quotes uh, an amazing feminist scholar during that performance. So, you know, there are these push pulls, right? You know, you don't want feminism to be reduced to um, just another catchword to sell pink razors um but you do want feminism to be seen as not a dirty word and as something that is powerful and and exciting enough that one of the most powerful artists in the world is willing to embrace it interesting thanks again jennifer for joining me do you have any final ideas you'd like to leave with the audience before we close and where can folks find you online i think my final thought is uh i really love talking about the kinds of things we've talked about today. So if anybody is at, um, at a nonprofit and they need, or, um, any activist organizations, community groups need media training, need, um, communications trainings. If anybody at schools need media literacy or racial and gender justice, uh, related talks and workshops, um, I'm happy to come to where you are and have these conversations in more depth with your community. Um, people can find me on Twitter at J E N N P O Z N E R at Jen Posner on on Facebook. Um, my book is at realitybitesbackbook.com. And you can also find uh, a several, I think, seven episode web series called Reality Rehab with Dr. Jen um, linked off of um, off of the book website, realitybitesbackbook.com or directly on YouTube, Reality Rehab with Dr. Jen. They can also find my work at Women in Media and News' website, wimnonline.org. Awesome. You've been listening to Jennifer Posner, journalist, media critic, media literacy educator, author of Reality Bites Back, The Troubling Truth About Guilty Pleasure TV, and the founder of Women in Media and News. She speaks frequently around the country about media literacy. Jennifer, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Joe. That concludes episode 49 of the podcast. Thanks so much to all of you for listening. And if you like what we do here, we'd love to hear from you. Please take a moment and head over to iTunes and give the show a rating and review. It helps others know what they can expect from the show and helps us out tremendously. Thanks again to all of you for listening, and I'll see you back here next week. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Washing Tech Policy Podcast. You've been briefed. 